Hi Year 11, this is Miss Curzons. I'm about to record a revision lecture on Cozy Apologia by Rita Duff. This is one of the love poems from your poetry anthology. Here's some background on the writer. As you know, you are marked for context in this section of the exam, so you do need to know some background information. Uh, Dove was the first African-American to hold the title of American Poet Laureate. That's a very prestigious title to have. Um, and so she was a huge trailblazer. Uh, she was also married to Fred Vibarn, who was a German writer, and he was white. So their relationship was an interracial marriage. And as a result of that, she would have experienced quite a lot of discrimination, not just because she was black, but also because her partner was white and some people found that offensive. So you need to take into account these experiences, which may well have influenced her writing and the message of her poetry. Here is some information about the title of the poem, um, which at first glance seems strange because it's kind of derived from Greek rather than just British English. Um, cozy is just the American spelling of cozy as in C-O-S-Y in British English, which just means comfort, familiarity, ease, informality, just being comfortable, basically. Apologia is a formal defense of something. So it's a written formal defense or speech that um, kind of defends or backs up an idea or a concept. So essentially what this title means then is a defense of coziness. She is defending the ordinary relationship that she has with her husband, Fred. She is trying to um, explain why we should value these ordinary loves that we find with one another and why we shouldn't always strive for an ideal romance that in her opinion doesn't really exist or never really um, meets our expectations. So she's defending an ordinary comfortable love but you also need to take into account her background and the fact that she was married to a white writer. Um, she may well also be defending this relationship because she felt the need to defend it because she experienced a lot of discrimination and backlash for her choice of partner. So this, this is a defense of her relationship in several different ways, not just the fact that it's ordinary, but also that it's interracial. I'm gonna track through the poem stanza by stanza because I feel that each stanza um, is saying something different. It has a separate message and I'll explain that as I go. So let's look at the first stanza. I could pick anything and think of you. This lamp, the wind still rain, the glossy blue, my pen exudes, drying matte upon the page. I could choose any hero, any cause or age, and sure as shooting arrows to the heart, astride a dappled mare, legs braced as far apart as standing in silver stirrups will allow. There you'll be, with furrowed brow and chain mail glinting, to set me free. One eye smiling, the other firm upon the enemy. So in this stanza, she starts by dedicating the poem and addressing the poem directly to her husband. This is clearly a poem for him, and she actually di directly addresses him using the pronoun you. She then goes on to describe him as if he is like a traditional medieval knight that's in shining armour and come to save her and free her from her oppression. And she uses lots of romantic tropes, which mean um, kind of common images that you find in romance, in order to convey that idea. So at this stage, you get this image of the kind of perfect fairy tale romance where the hero swoops in and saves the damsel in distress. And that's what she's kind of trying to create through this first stanza. You'll notice that those two words in red at the top, I and you, they're both pronouns to create this sense of intimacy, this tone of um, closeness and personal relationship between the two of them. It's almost as if we're listening in on a private conversation between them. So she's trying to highlight here just how how close and how strong their relationship is one another by bookmarking that first line with those two pronouns, I and you. You'll also notice that she repeats, she uses repetition um, of the word any, anything, any hero, any cause. She uses this repetition to kind of emphasize how her love for him is limitless, no matter where she looks, no matter what she sees or who she hears, it's him that's on her mind. Her love for him is inescapable. It's in every nook and cranny of her life. Um, and it almost suggests that he is inescapable as well, that he almost surrounds her. Her life revolves around him. 
And then you've got in green there the, the main romantic tropes, those sort of stereotypical images of romance that she's adopting in order to create this kind of perfect love story. Sure, shooting arrows to the heart. You've got the idea of Cupid shooting his arrows. Standing in silver stirrups, you've got this hero standing upon a large horse. Um, and then chainmail glinting. Chainmail is a form of a suit of armour. So it's as if he's there like a medieval knight ready to save the day. Um, and so you've got this perfect union, this perfect relationship that perfectly mimics what we expect based on what we read in the media, what we see in books and what we watch in films. And that perfection is also mirrored in the rhyming couplets. You've got you, blue, page, age, heart, apart, allow, brown, free, and enemy. Completely unbroken rhyming couplets there to create this sense of harmony, of a perfect union, of a relationship that is untainted. So this is the initial impression we get of their relationship. As the poem progresses, we realise that that's maybe not actually an accurate representation of what their love is like. And in fact, here she's just almost sardonically using these images to, to, to mock our expectations, our societal expectations of love, because they're so unattainable and they're so ridiculous. So we'll see that as we go. In the second stanza, she shifts focus away from Fred, away from her husband, and onto her previous lovers, her previous relationships, which were nowhere near as harmonious or as content as her relationship now with her husband. Here you go. This post-postmodern age is all business, compact discs and faxes, a do-it-now and take-no-risks event. Today a hurricane is nudging up the coast, oddly male, big bad Floyd, who brings a host of daydreams, awkward reminiscences of teenage crushes on worthless boys whose only talent was to kiss you senseless. They all had sissy names, Marcel, Percy, Dewey, were thin as licorice and as chewy, sweet with a dark and hollow centre. Floyd's. So she's starting here critiquing modern life. She's implying that in this day and age, we've actually lost track of what's important and we're just obsessed with business and money making and profit. And we've lost track of what love really is. Then she moves on to talk about her past relationship. She's reminiscing about the time she spent with other men who she actually describes as being boys. Um, and how chaotic and unpleasant those relationships were because they promised something sweet, but in reality, in reality they were hollow. Um, so in that opening line, you've got the sounds, p -p -b -d, post postmodern age, business, discs. Those are all examples of plosive sounds, very heavy sounds, almost as if she's spitting at us, post postmodern age, business, discs. It creates a sense of disapproval, of disgust, um, of criticism. And that's because she is very much against our focus and our obsession with these new things, these modern um, developments. And she's almost implying that we've lost track of what's important in life. So she's using those plosives to create that dismissive tone. Then when she starts talking about the hurricane, which is a metaphor for her previous lovers and how chaotic and um, damaging they were for her, she actually undermines the power of the hurricane. Rather than making it seem powerful and dangerous, she actually uses the verb nudging, which is quite a passive, almost pathetic action, um, describes him as oddly male, rather than just male, powerfully male, oddly male. She's almost mocking him. And then Big Bad Floyd makes us think of the villain in a fairy tale, like the Big Bad Wolf, which as adults we no longer find frightening. So she's almost trying to um, emasculate this hurricane and therefore emasculate her previous relationships to expose them as something that has no power and no influence over her anymore and are actually quite pathetic. She also uses another sound here, as well as plosive, she's using sibilance with reminiscences, crushes, worthless boys, kiss, senseless, sissy, this S sound constantly being echoed throughout those lines, kind of creates a tone of bitterness. Um, it's almost as if she very much resents the time that she spent with these men that ultimately were a waste of her time. And you'll notice that she even refers to them as boys, not men 
once again emasculating them and suggesting that they don't live up to what she now considers to be a man, i.e. Fred, her husband. So she's emasculating them, kind of making them seem inferior in order to elevate her love for her husband and how perfect and manly and true their relationship is in comparison to these previous relationships. You've also got that metaphor sweet with a dark and hollow center. She's kind of um, describing these relationships as if they were confectionery, sweets or chocolates that appear sweet, appear attractive on the outside, but in reality have no substance to them whatsoever. And that's what she's implying about these men, these boys that she was with before, that they ultimately had nothing to them. There was nothing interesting or fascinating about them. They were just empty or hollow. So thinking about the structure here then, in comparison to the previous stanza, which was all perfect rhyming couplets here, those couplets are disturbed in line five. So you've got coast and host, but then you've got reminiscences, boys, senseless, dewy, chewy, floyds. There is some rhyme scheme, but it's very much um, staggered and disrupted. So it's almost as if the, the hurricane or the boys that are represented by the hurricane have broken up that rhyme scheme because her relationship with them was nowhere near as harmonious and as perfect as her relationship with her husband. So these relationships are made to seem kind of painful and chaotic in comparison. Um, one extra piece of context for you is that Hurricane Floyd was a real event that did take place in America in 1999. Now, you don't really need to know about the amount of damage that was done. You don't really need to know how many people were killed, but you just need to know that this was a real life event and that Dove is using this to emphasize just how damaging those relationships were for her. Okay. The final stanza then, she shifts her attention back to her husband, but this time she's not using all of those romantic tropes. The idealized romantic images are gone and they've been replaced by something more realistic. Um, and here she's trying to suggest that actually she's more content with this real life, day-to-day -day relationship than she would be with the fairy tale that she described in the first stanza. So let's have a look. You're bunkered in your airy, I'm perched in mine. Twin desks, computers, hardwood floors. We're content but fall short of the divine. Still, it's embarrassing, this happiness. Who's satisfied simply with what's good for us? When has the ordinary ever been news? And yet, because nothing else will do to keep me from this melancholy, call it blues, I fill the stolen time with you. So she's kind of abandoned all of those tropes, all of those stereotypes that she used in the first stanza, and now she's just being honest. She's presenting to us a real, true relationship, um, which is far more representative of uh, people's relationships in real life. You know, people, her readers may actually recognize this kind of relationship. Um, and she's saying, you know, okay, it's not blessed by God. Okay, it's not just like the fairy tales and like the movies, but we're content and that's what matters. So she opens with this metaphor, you're bunkered in your airy, I'm perched in mine. An airy is like a bird's nest. She's essentially saying we're nestled away from the storm, we're protected, we're secure, we're safe, we're elevated above all of the stresses of modern life because we have each other. And so it's almost as if the relationship itself acts as a form of defense against those um, dangerous things like the hurricane. Twin desks, computers, hardwood floors. She's got this list of three within brackets here to illustrate, I think, just how ordinary their relationship is. You know, yes, they've got matching desks, they share an office, they've got computers, hardwood floors. She's trying to almost relate to her reader. These are things that the reader may well recognize in their own life. And she's trying to say, this is the true image of what a relationship is like, not a, a man in chain mail standing upon a horse and saving you from a villain, actually just being happy in real life. We're content, she says, but fall short of the divine. You've got that juxtaposition between content and divine, divine implying that it's so great, it's almost godly. She's saying, no, we're not. And I'll admit that, you know, there's nothing godly or saintly about our relationship, but we are happy and relationships don't have to be blessed by God or feel, you know, so extraordinary that they're almost heavenly. In reality, 
you know, a good relationship is just one where you are content. And then ultimately at the end, she re reverts back to this use of the two pronouns. I fill the stolen time with you. I and you bookmarking that final line, just like they bookmark the first line at the beginning, creating like a circular structure. It's almost as if she's trying to create a sense of completeness, of fulfillment, which almost may reflect how she feels about her relationship with her husband. He completes her. She feels content and fulfilled with him. So this is quite a complex poem and it's a very diff difficult one to pick apart. But I would say that what she's trying to do here is illustrate the difference between idealized love and realistic love. Um, she starts with an idealized love, which is almost completely unattainable. And she does it in a kind of sarcastic way, I think. Then she demonstrates what happens when love goes wrong through the hurricane and her previous relationships. And then she reverts back to talking about her husband, but she's lost all of those stereotypes. She's lost all of that facade. And she's just being honest about what a normal relationship is like. And I think in this final stanza is where we get her true message, which is that we should be happy with the ordinary. We should not strive for something that is unattainable. So just to sum up then the structure, you've got the rhyme scheme there. Stanza one's got the perfect rhyming couplets to, to demonstrate the perfect love that's being described. Then they're disrupted by the hurricane in stanza two. Obviously, her previous relationships were not as harmonious and therefore they don't have rhyming couplets. And then in the final stanza, you don't see a return of the rhyming couplets, but there is almost a new rhyme scheme emerging, something that's a bit more natural, a bit more comfortable, not quite as contrived or as forced as rhyming couplets. And so we're left with something that feels a bit more achievable. And then in terms of form and punctuation, uh, the stanzas are all the same number of lines and the line length themselves are all similar, which you could say reflects that how stable and ordinary their, their love is. And then in the second stanza, you've got lots of caesura, which is pauses in the middle of lines, which might reflect that hurricane and the, the tumult that was created by her previous relationships. Obviously, you know that you need to try and weave in both context and structure throughout your analysis of language. Hopefully that was helpful to you, Year 11. Good luck with your final exams and I'll see you soon.